Hello, Michelle, how are you? Hey, um, <laughs> I uh, bought a USB to RS-232 serial adapter mm -hmm. to connect it to the console cable. Mm -hmm. And I, I was able to uh, flash the switch, uh, Cisco 2960, and got it to reset. So awesome. thank you. Yes, I needed, I didn't know that I needed two cables, the console cable plus the adapter to connect the switch to my laptop. Yeah, well, depending on the system that you are consoling into the, the, the device, um, sometimes you can directly connect into it. Yeah, if you don't have the COM port, you have to adapt it. Mm -hmm. Can you use like USB-C? No, no, I bought one at Best Buy. They had an open box. I got it for $14. Okay. So it was great. It, I, I couldn't believe it. Awesome. I wanted to, well, I bought some of these. Hold on. I bought some USB-C. Let's see where I put it. Yeah, I bought some USB-C um, console cable and on Amazon for fairly cheap actually or maybe I put it on the other desk but yeah it's um you can all you have to do is install the driver for it um the the RS you know 2323 two, three, whatever case oh I didn't have case. to it just did oh, it itself yeah oh that's nice that's yeah. good firmware on that because usually some of the cheaper ones you just have to pull the some of them, they just automatically configure and then some of them you have to install, but good. All right, so now it's reset. You can start from scratch. <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> good, how long have you had that switch? I don't know if it was like a year or two. Okay. Yeah, I just haven't done anything with it. Okay, all right, so now you can practice on it. That's fantastic. Yeah. Okay. All right, so let's get started for today. We are gonna do parallel processing. Um, we are gonna use VirtualBox Ubuntu machine. But before you start your VirtualBox Ubuntu machine, um, let me get to my unit eight. Oh, sorry, I'm on my backup drive. I was like, where's my stuff? Okay, um, for the lab, at the beginning, I made a note that you need to change your configuration on your virtual box. Otherwise, it doesn't, it doesn't run parallel processing. It'll just be one processor. Okay. Uh -huh. A little flustered everywhere. Oh, one of it. Okay. All right. So we are gonna do a few programs. Um, so I want to just kind of run through and, and talk about these programs. Um, you can use the Ubuntu one. If you are running out of space, just delete some of the old files that you have. Um, multiprocessing, you don't require to install any kind of package. We're not going to do that today. I was going to do some TensorFlow stuff, but we'll save it for a later time. Um, I think TensorFlow require additional installation and stuff like that. So, so when you open up your virtual box um, here, I made a note that you need to change your processor, okay? Um, when I ran this a few times, um, I tested it last night and I tested it this morning just to make sure. Um, there was one time that it was hanging a little bit, possibly it's just because I was running different things. Um, so, on your virtual box, when you open up the application, just um, for your virtual machine, right? This is my virtual machine. Just go ahead and change your setting by clicking setting. And then you're gonna go to system. Here is where you can change your RAM and things like that. We've done that in the past, but processor tab is gonna give us the processor configuration. So while you, can run all of your program in virtual machine. If you don't change this, you're not gonna see the difference between uh, sequential processing and parallel processing. Um, you might find that, you know, when you write the instruction for parallel processing using one processor is actually slower. Um, so what we want is we want to change this value. So I have an eight core 
um, which is four physical core. So what I want to give my machine is maybe half of it. So if you have a quad core, uh, you can possibly give it two. Um, you want to not take your whole system down to one core because it, it will be slow and your virtual machine will be relying on your whole system to operate still, right? Um, so what you want is you want, if you have like 12 core or higher or something, you can give it like four core. Four core is gonna be good enough. Um, or if you, you only have quad core, then you just give it two. That's all we need is maybe multiple core to really see the difference, okay? And so once you have that, you just click okay. And then you can go ahead and start. So let me move this zoom bar, okay? And then your virtual machine will boot. Now, um, if you look into it, um, VirtualBox, the way that they design how the system uses the core is it's, because it is an application, right? We are using an application to virtualize our um, another computer running Linux. Um, and they, the way that they wrote it is they use threads um, as, in, as each individual core for the application. And interesting enough, so, you know, from the thread instructions, it's able to utilize your actual physical core. Um, so, you know, if you want to read into that, you can also look that up with Oracle. Okay, so what we did there was to change the core, and that's important because we're not going to be able to see the difference if you don't. Um, and if you're only going to run a single core, which is the default setting for VirtualBox, you're not going to see the time difference when you compare the, the program that you're going to write. So after we create we change our core, we run our Ubuntu, we are going to go in, and it might take a little longer to start, sorry, um, mine is still going, there it is. Then you're going to log in. Okay, and if you're using the old Ubuntu from our lab two, um, CIS 30, E, all capitalized with the exclamation point is our password. If you create your own, then you have your own password. So once it's going to load, um, it's then, then what all we need to do is we are going to go into our terminal. And then let me see if I can, I have another profile that might be a little larger. Okay. So, um, in, in our terminal, we are simply gonna write our program, okay? So just to give you a little bit of background, we are writing a program that's gonna calculate pi, right? We know we all know what pi value is, 3.14 round off, but um, there are many super systems that are used to be able to calculate these pi to get it down to so many decimal points. Um, and so what I want to show you is that when you, you, when you create a program to calculate pi, if it's a sequential program, that means that it's only gonna use like one processor to really run. It's gonna go from top to bottom and be able to give you some kind of calculation as the pi value. You're gonna see that it's just very basic and you're gonna have a time, okay, when we calculate that then you are gonna write a parallel processing program that calculate pi, where it's gonna maximize and use multiple cores so you can see the difference. So in terminal, we are gonna use nano to write our program and um, the programs is not too long, just make sure that we check our syntax, okay? And then, um, so here is now, you know, never mind. Uh, so in here, we're just gonna call up nano pi calculator dot, make sure we have a, a file extension. So I have dot py for Python. So what maybe I should use something that's a little smaller. So here's the program um, we have, 
we're going to import in decimal and get context so that way it's going to give us the decimal points that we're going to use for the pi value because you as you know um, when we when we generate the pi value it can be in a very la larger range decimal so that's why we want to make sure that we utilize the library in order to control our decimal point. Then we are gonna time it. So we are gonna use Linux uh, time it library, and then we are gonna use the timer. We have a function called pi, and we are gonna use precision variable. We pass that inside that function. Then we are gonna use the get context precision for precision. And this is just gonna give us the approximate decimal points that we want, okay? And then we are gonna return from that function and just to calculate, it's gonna, we're gonna apply this, okay? And we have a for loop that's, it's a full range that's gonna be able to give us the pi value. Um, with that, we are gonna start the timer. So for the values that we're gonna use, there are gonna be three values that's gonna be generated the 1,000, 1,500, and 2,000. And if you read what pi really is, if you're not, you don't remember from grade school where they talk about pi and using pi to calculate your, uh, the area of a circle or, you know, using that to, to for cylinder dimension and so on. So it is really a, a ratio of a circumference of any circle in a diameter. And it is a irrational number whose decimal um, neither ends or becomes repetitive. So you're gonna see that in the decimal value, it's gonna be all different. It's not repetitive and it can go all, it's, it's endless, it's infinite, okay? So scientifically, there are systems that are used to, um, find the pi value as precise as possible, meaning that they want to go to like the millionth or the trillion uh, decimal place. And we're not gonna do that, but we want to use the uh, compute the pi value to a certain decimal length. So then um, there are certain formula or equation that you can use and the approximation of the time. So we are gonna use um, daily Bowen and flow uh, formula to calculate the pi. Okay, so that's the equation that we're gonna use in this particular program. So here is our, we are gonna do three values for the pi. And we are gonna list and map those values. Okay, so here we have a tuple that's gonna contain 1,000, 1,500, and 2,000. And we are gonna put the data into a list and in that list, we're gonna use the map method to, and then in that we are gonna call the pi function and we are gonna use values tuple. Okay, then we're gonna print. So after you have this, then you just simply do control X to save and then you have to press yes. As I didn't change, anything in my program, right? I didn't have to confirm that I wanted to save over the, the for that file name. So once you have your, your program written, you're gonna save and exit nano. And then we are gonna call on Python, so Python 3, and we are just gonna run the program. So as you output, you are gonna see that it's gonna put it into a list, okay? And it might look very overwhelming. So whenever that you see the decimal, that's the start of another value, okay? So the output, it's gonna give you three, three pi result from in, inside a list, okay? So the first one, it's gonna go all the way to here, and that's gonna be your, your pi value, okay? And then on the second one, 
we are going to go from here right to let me see if I can pull it down to further but you should be able to see three I think my screen got cut off and it got mixed in. oh right here is where it starts the third one okay and it goes until the end so at the end it's going to also give you the time so sequentially it's able to compute the value at this time. Okay. So that just means that we are writing a normal Python program to compute three pi values, okay, in certain decimal positions. And then we are going to output that. So simply the interpreter is going to go from top to bottom, right? Um, as it execute the code. So we are doing it synchronously. We're not doing anything special in this one. Then um, what you're gonna do is after you have that, you take a look at the output, give me a screen capture, take a note of the sequential time that it gives you. So on mine, and yours might be a little different, of course, because everybody used different processor. So on mine, this is the sequential time that it provided, 0 0.476, etc. Okay. And you should have three pi values as you would look each, the beginning of each of the pi value that it gives you, it would say decimal. And so that's how we can distinguish. How do I know it's three? Well, if you take a look at the code, right? We're calculating pi from these right here. Those are, that's the tuple that we, we implemented. So that will be 1,500 and 2,000. So now, after you have that, right, that will be the requirement for the first program. Then we are going to take a look at the second program. We are going to jazz up the first program and we are going to implement parallel processing so you can see the difference. So once it's computed, you have an output, then you're going to come back to terminal. And then you are going to open up Nano again. And I think I call mine pycal2.py. Okay. So in the second program, which is different than the first, we also use the decimal package. We also use time it, but in this one, we added multiprocessing. So we would have from multiprocessing, that will be the package that we're gonna use. We're gonna import pool and current process. And remember that we talked about pool object, how we're gonna be able to utilize pool to generate workers process. So we can have different processes that can capitalize on multiprocessor capability to be able to give us the result. And then we're gonna import time. <clears throat> so the function from the first program is the same. We're not doing anything different there, but to make it, um, to make it parallel process, okay, then we have to add in the main so that way we can build out the object for our parallel processing. So here in the main, we're going to start the timer and we are going to create, right, the pool. And for the pool, we want to pass three because that's going to be the three values that we're going to use. And we're going to bring in the tuple for
for the calculation. So which is values 1,500 and 2,000. Now the data on the parallel processing, in, instead of just mapping it like what we've seen in the previous, we since we have a pool object, we are going to use that pool object to access the property which maps to the pi value and it's going to call on the other method or the other function. And then we're going to print and we're going to end the timer so it's going to finish. So in the main, you have to start the timer and finish up the timer. So you would be able to um, really measure that time that it's going to take to execute. OK. And just slight difference. So the only main section that we are really adding is this. And we modify, we take the values and we declare that inside the main. Okay, and then we wanted to print. So we would have print and I wanted to show that it's parallel. And then lastly, we have to have that statement for the namespace. So we would say if namespace is main, we're gonna call main. Okay. Any question? Then we're going to save and exit nano. After that, we just run it. So as you can see, I shave off a little bit of time there. So about 0.10, approximately, or 0.14. So you do see that it's slightly faster. And it also vary depending on, you know, your virtual machine core that you dedicate it to. So there are factors that we would consider, like the number of cores that we're using. Um, so if you giving it less core compared to more core, you would see the difference there. Yes, I'm using four. Okay. So the output <clears throat> for this, you are still going to get, you know, the pi value as you look through your result. Okay. So there should be three pi values. Each one is separated, right? It is a tuple inside a list for each of the pi value. Okay. Any question? So we saw that in the second program, right? We are using parallel processing. We are gonna get faster time. So take a screen capture of your output. What is the time used? So it should say the, the amount of time at the end. And when you compare that to the previous program, is parallel processing faster? Now, if you only give it one core and you run and test it, you're gonna see that it's gonna be like really close or sometime even slower. Okay, you won't see the difference. Okay, any question with part A? All right, no question. 
So the program that we're writing, it's not too long. Okay, you should be able to produce that. Um, for part B, part B touches also on pi since you know we're on the topic. So we, and the book also mentioned this particular method, um, Monte Carlo method. So Monte Carlo methods are a broad class of computational algorithm that rely on repeated random sampling of numerical input. So earlier when you were doing the pi, you are using static input in like 1,000, 1,500, and 2,000. In Monte Carlo, what you can do is you can generate random input and it's gonna utilize those input to be able to apply to the calculation of the pi, okay? So there's randomness in how we would use to solve the problem and to make, and this is part of the deterministic and the principle. So the equation for this, okay, is gonna be pi four um, equal to m times n, where m is the number of the generated points in the square and n is the number of points, okay? Mathematically aside, right, that's the equation that's implemented into the algorithm. So we just wanted to know what that is. And this is um, a way that we can calculate pi, but it is not accurate as what you've seen in the last two exercises, okay? And there are many different ways that people implement um, algorithm to compute pi. So I just want you to know that we're only examining a few ways. Okay, so we are gonna write one for the Monte Carlo. And in the first one, just like the first exercise, we are going to utilize the sequential measurement and, and we are gonna compare it to a parallel uh, the parallel processing program that we're gonna write after this, okay? So in your Linux machine, you can open up a file called montecarlo.py and then you're gonna put this in, okay? So we can say nano montecarlo.py And since we're using random input, we are gonna import random. And this particular algorithm requires square root. So we are going to have to import math. So for math, import square root. We are gonna time it. So we have to use time it library and we're gonna import the default timer as timer. So in the pi function, we are going to have, basically we're going to iterate and we are going to have a loop for range. Your X and Y input will be random values. The R is going to be square root of X squared plus Y squared. If R is less than one, it's going to increment the count. And then we'll move down here. Okay, and then it's gonna return four times count divided by n. Then we are gonna start timer and it's gonna be approximate. So um, now when you run this one, it's gonna take about between I want to say 20 to 40 something seconds. So <clears throat> give it time and make sure that you wait for the complete in output. Okay, because it's going to generate the output and it's going to also compute the time and give you the time estimation. So this, like it says in the description of your exercise, that you are going to get an estimate of pi value, not the exact. Okay, 
So compared to the last one, you're not going to get down to a certain decimal value, you know, more, the other one will be more precise. So it's going to print the elapsed time. And then it's going to print the pi value and estimate. Okay. So once we're done, we just hit control X and yes to save and then enter. Then we're going to run the program. So give it a little bit of time to execute and you are going to get some kind of output. Um, I ran this a few times and the first few times it was about 40 something seconds. And then one of the times that I, I tested it at the end, it was about 30 something seconds. So, okay. So it might look like it's pausing there, right? But just got to give it some time. Okay. So when it's finished, you can take a screen capture, make a note of the elapsed time because we are going to compare it in the next one in part C. So here's my output, okay. It took about 38 seconds and the pi estimate is 3.1416128. Now, if you run it again, you might get somewhere close to that, but not exact as we are also using random input. Okay. So here we can take a look at using Monte Carlo methods is definitely slower. Um, on my system, I am running, I'm using 16 gigs of RAM and I gave, um, let me check my virtual box. I think, oh yeah, I gave it, it says it right here, um, about two gig of RAM for the virtual machine. So in the amount of RAM that you also give it also impact the virtual machine, of course. Okay, so if we do two gigs, that's a standard for most VM to really operate well nowadays, right? Um, you can go lower, but it's gonna be really slow. And then I'm running a four core on the virtual machine. So my host would have four core. So on the physical, that will only be two core and two core, okay? So your logical cores are always gonna be double your physical core. Okay, any question? So we have a pi estimate, it's rounded off. Now we are gonna look at how we can make it into multiprocessing program. So in the chapter, it introduces the concept of taking a function and breaking it into subtasks. So when you do that, what you're doing is you are allowing the machine to understand the instructions separately, okay? And it's gonna be able to execute that as separate subtasks. Um, as the book talk about distributed memory, which kind of bring us to the next part. But um, so what we're gonna do after we write the Monte Carlo program and run it, we are going to create another program that uses Monte Carlo methods. So basically we're taking the old program and then modify it, okay? All 
let me check. Monte Carlo two. That P Y. So in the second Monte Carlo program, basically it's the same with random at the top. We are going to import random as we're using random input. Now, since we're doing multiprocessing, so we are going to use multiprocessing module and we are going to import pool and CPU count because it's going to we, we want some of that at the end to show this is the time that it uses this many core to run. Then um, we are going to have the math uh, library to book the, the calculation and then the timer. In the, the function, it's pretty much the same as the last. Move down. Doing something here. Okay. Let's move down. All right. So after that, we are going to have the main definition. Uh, so main function, we're going to start the timer just like the last program that, that you've done. We're going to have an object called NP, and it's going to store your CPU count. That's why we import that in as part of the, the package. Then um, we are going to print. You have this many cores. And then we declare n. And here is where we would do a part count. So your part count is going to be n divided by np, which is your, your CPU count. And for in the range. So what you're doing is you are subdividing the task to the processor, okay? Because you're giving, you're creating a list of processes and you are gonna pull, so it's a pool of processes and you're gonna cast each of the process for each of the uh, processor. Basically, you're gonna map to it. So here is where we would have the pool Okay, and that your pool is gonna map to the part count and pi part. And then your pi estimate, this is what we're computing, right? Would be some count divided by n times one times four. And then we finish that with the timer and we print. Then after the main function, we have the if main statement. So if main stays same, we're going to call main. <clears throat> we save and close nano. Then we are going to run the program. <clears throat> so it's going to give you the core count first. And just like the other one, you gotta give it some time. Okay. So I'm using four core. And when you look at the elapsed time, when you give you break it into subtasks, it's definitely faster compared to the previous. Here on mine, it's 38.26. And for the, when we're using all four core, it is 13.57. Um, 
And you would notice because it's randomizing the number, you don't get the same exact number for pi output. And also it rounds it off too, so. Any question? So when we do this lab, we can see that definitely multiprocessing or parallelism does work, right? Especially when we're in the modern processor architecture. So as you finish that program, what you would do is you would take a screenshot of your output, make a note of your elapsed time, and compare that to the previous program. Is it faster, right? Why is it faster? You can put like maybe a sentence there. How is the elapsed time compared to the result in 15B? So in the last two parallel processing program, this one and the prior, what we see is we are using a pool and we create a pool of processes. And that's gonna allow us to execute and improve performance in our application. Any question with part C? Okay, no question. Okay, so now we're gonna circle back to the beginning of the chapter, which it talks about, you know, distributed memory, right? And then also in the middle of the chapter, it talks about the workers or process workers. So when you have a main process, when you subdivide it, um, you can break it into different processes. And the way that we look at this is we can manage the memory or where it stores the data together as in shared memory or separate. So in part D, what we're gonna do is we're gonna examine the pool class and the worker processes and how it uses memory that would be not shared because when we create processes, we are using a distributed memory location for one for each. Okay. Now in threading, then we would use shared memory. But if you read the documentation for multiprocessing, it does talk about how you can use C type to be able to. Um, type it as a certain data type and then be able to share that memory space, but we would have to use an interface to access it, um, which kind of bring us to part E. So in part D, we are going to write a program that's gonna be representing multi-processes or what we call worker processes. 
and we are going to look at, we're going to examine where it stores its data. Okay. So in your terminal, you are going to nano workers the dot py and you're going to write your code there. Okay. Let me see. I have, let me, I didn't put the S. Very well. So in this program, we are going to use multiprocessing again. And in this one, instead of using the pool object, we are going to use the process object. So we're going to import in process class and its object. And then we're going to import in current process from multiprocessing. Then we simply have a global list that contains values. So data is going to be one and two. So what it will do is it will create a location for that container, that list. Then we have a function called pfun. And you have to use the keyword global here because you're using a package that has a superclass and subclass. So when you're using something from its um, child, right, a child object, we want to make sure that we, our container is accessible within that package when we're using that, okay? So here we're going to do global data. And what we're going to do is we are going to extend that list by adding in three, four, and five. And most of you learned this in 30A where you can add more elements into the list by extending it. And we're going to print the result. And it's going to tell us the name of the current process and the data. And then after that, we're going to define our main function. We have an object called worker. And this is a process object. As it is a process object, we have to target the function. Okay, so we call we we target the function that we define here. And just like the beginning of the assignment earlier this week, we have to start and join. So we use the start method and the join method there. Then we print the result in main and the data. And you would see that it would be slightly different than what you would see here, okay? Then we have the if namespace statement, that's gonna be main and we're gonna call main. And we save and we're going to run the program. So the original container is still in the main. So it's one and two. But as you look at the code, you extend the original container to be one, two, three, four, five, as they would be separate processes, it's stored in a different location as a different list. So the takeaway from this is that when you're using the worker processes, right, the system will dedicate separate location for the worker processes. So now we actually, well, for the program, it created different location there. One for the main, which is the original 
container for data. And second is a different list that store the, date, the original data and the extended values. How many workers process are there? So coming back to here, let me show you. So when you extend this, right, it's gonna build the object and there's only gonna be one function. So that's just one additional. S, it's going to execute three, four, and five because we only target it once here. Now, if you want to have more workers, then what you would do is you would have to have a pool of processes and then map to that, right? So to answer your question, there's only one additional process along with the main so total of two. And every time that you start a process, right, uh, you have to, so when the way that you use, you add an additional process, you would use, you create an object for it and you start and you join it, okay? But if you have multiple processes and multiple functions, um, you know, in the documentation, my notes, and then also the text, it talks about how you have to pull those processes and then map them because it would cut up the location of the memory. And those are all in different addresses as your data is uh, dynamically writing to RAM. So what will happen is it's gonna then be able to map to that particular address. And so when it executes, it has to go and retrieve the data from those location. So in that case, we have to create a pool object as well, along with the process object. I think I put a few example in the notes regarding using multiple functions and creating multiple workers. Okay, so that's a very simple program. So you can see, right, visibly we can see where that each of the lists are pulled from different area. Um, and so for number 20 and 21, after you run the program, uh, take a screen capture and it asks you, it tells you that we create a worker to which we pass the global data list. We add additional value to the list of the worker, but the original list in the main is not modified. Okay, so how many lists did you see in the output? So the point that I wanna drive away from here is that when you add that additional worker, it uses a separate location to store its data. Any question? Okay. So as some of you wrapping up the last part or the last exercise, Right, I can preview E. So going the other way, we want to look at how we can write a program that's using shared memory. Um, 
just the side note on using shared memory, what we have to implement, okay? So here I put that the below program data can be stored in a shared memory using value array. And I think in the text and also the documentation um, shows that you can use value as a class and its object to be able to create um, shared location for processes. So all that uh, does is it's using a method in order to retrieve the data. It goes to that contiguous location in the memory and pull the data. Okay, because in the previous exercise, it's actually pulling the data from another location. In this one, we wanna combine everything and put it into one space. So each of the processes increases the counter and it's, it's recommended that we avoid sharing data between processes because what happens when you update your data in one process and another process needs to be able to utilize that data, it creates a conflict. So a way to utilize the shared memory for multiple processes is to use message passing. And message passing interface, the MPI is just an object-oriented interface. It works with C++. It supports point-to-point -point and collective communication, what they call a pickable Python object. And that will allow the Python objects to be exposed to the buffer of the interface. So what that does is it's gonna copy that to a location where that interface can access the value. That's just a side note. We don't implement MPI in this particular program. I just wanted to include that there so you know what technique is used to when you implement shared memory for multiple processes. And in their documentation, they do go into how you can pipe that and be able to to use uh, MPI. MPI is a package that you can install and use the library um, and its method, just like how you use multiprocessing and other libraries. And as you see, right, most of these are C-based, so we mainly use C compiler. It works best with Linux compared to if you have Windows, you have to use uh, Visual Studio. Okay. So here is um, the program. We would then go in and it logs me out for one second. Let me exit out of this. And we are going to create a new file called shared.py. And we're going to write our code there. So in the documentation, um, it mentions that when you use multiprocesses in a shared location, you have to lock it. Okay, that means that when, when it's accessing, when it's pulling the value for that process, we want it to lock it so that way it's not being um, in, in the other process as the other processor queuing, it's not going to be able to have any kind of conflict with the value. So here is where we would have multiprocessing library. We're going to import the process object. We're going to import value. We're going to time it. In our function, which is called f, 
We're going to use counter. We later declared that in the main. We're going to have it sleep for one second. And here is where we're going to use the get lock method. And we're going to increment the counter.value. So it's going to print the counter and the value. In the main, we have another method. And here we declare the counter. And we're going to use a value, which is a class. So counter is an object of value. Okay. And what we are going to have, we're going to have I. Okay. So for our process, we're going to target the function that we wrote, we defined, that's F. And we're going to pass counter arguments. Let's make sure we have the comma. And we're going to loop. It's cutting off. So, so that's going to allow us to do a group of 30. So that will be in a range of 30. Then we are going to start the process and we are going to join. So it's also going to loop that. So as it counts up, right, it's going to initialize that process and then it's going to go to the next and so on. And then lastly, we just call main. So when we exit, we're going to do python3 shares.py. So here, as you can see, we simply count from 1 to 30. And you would see, let me pull it up. For most part, it will sequentially increment so for mine, it skips eight here. And then it Q8, so eight comes in later. And everything else is all sequential. Now I can run this again and see if it is different. Okay, you're gonna see that your counter is gonna be different there. There's going to always be. So on the second time, you notice that it's not in order. OK. As it's still going to use that same location to be able to retrieve your data. So what I noted on the bottom of this is for number 23, after you run the program, take a screen capture. It creates a counter uh, object that is shared among processes. As it increases with the counter using the with counter get lock counter value increments there, each process must acquire its a lock for itself. So what you would, as it counts up, you would see that it's going to have to lock. Okay. Now, all you want to do is to run the program, check the output, and see if anything is out of order, right? So the first time I run this program, I see that eight is not, okay. And then the second time I run, they're completely out of order. Questions? 
question. Oh, this is a, how can it repeat? It cannot repeat. <laughs> I, to be exact, no, right? So um, I'll show you. So this time when I run it again, right? See how it's not in order? Because they are separate processes, but they're in the same location to retrieve. It doesn't always mean that you are going to get the same data. And I think that's what we're trying to, to show is that when you put, when you put it into one location, the, your, your output will not be accurate in that it's not, it's always, once you update it, it's, it's going to change. Okay. And even when we lock every single process that it goes through, um, when you run it the second time, you're not gonna get the same result as the, the, the first time and everything subsequent. So a better way to approach this is to make it into a, a thread instructions, like using you know library for threads instead of doing multi-processes from a, the same location, okay? So in the last exercise, that will be more effective. If you want to implement processes, you should keep it as a distributed location, distributed memory. Yeah, you can see how many Let's take a look at the code. Because if you, if you initiate that object, um, but remember that this one, we loop through it 30 times, okay? As we do the counter value here. Yeah, so your processes is multiple processes here. And it's using all your processes for 30, the, to loop 30 times. See how this is, this is, a, this is a list and you have a process, right? And you're gonna target. So for every single loop, it's gonna treat it as a separate process. compared to the last one, we only add on one process. Okay. Now, can this program be improved? Sure, uh, if, if, you know, if you want to rewrite this and make it better, you would have to add, make those processes. So after the, it generates this. So I would put this into um, another function and then create a pool object and then use that pool object inside the main. That will be a better approach. And also not use, not use shared memory. If you do, you would have to implement an interface. Because your values are gonna pool not sequentially. As it is, there are all different processes. Okay, any other questions? Okay, thanks. All right, so these are just a few program. Um, I originally wanted to include similar example in the notes, but I felt like Grant, you know, uh, going off from on a tangent compared to what the book was talking about with just added stuff. So I wanted to take this opportunity and show you how you can implement parallelism in Python, uh, you know, using your Linux virtual machine.
Okay. The only downside with running VM like this is that, you know, when you code, you have to use Nano, unless if you have a bigger virtual machine, you can always install an IDE on it and be able to use that. But every time it uses an application like an IDE, just make sure that it's properly linked, right? Um, and, you know, to set it up and making sure that you have the appropriate library inside, just like how you would use on a regular computer. Um, so, but yeah, definitely you can do everything in terminal and be able to, to build your program. Um, professor, I have mm -hmm. a question regarding how I can free up uh, space on my uh, virtual machine, page two. Mm -hmm. um, like I have uninstalled most of the packages like that came with it and um, all the ones that we downloaded um, for Python. Mm -hmm. It's just, it keeps running out of um, memory and this is like the second one I created. Does it tell you out of drive space or is it out of memory? It's out of drive, I believe. Okay. So the way that you can check is also, yeah, I'm on Ubuntu only, not the Kubuntu. Um, the interface is different, let me see. You know, you can always create another virtual machine. It doesn't take very long. It's like 10, 15 minutes. Um, only downside is that you have to download Ubuntu, but you know, to answer your questions, mm -hmm. you can, you know, if you deleted all the files that we yeah. use, like PyTest and things like that. Yeah. Um, let me see, hold on one second. I don't think I deleted all the files that I, like I constantly kept doing that because it'll constantly run out of space. So I constantly deleted files and <laughs> sounds <laughs> sounds like my laptop <laughs> um, okay you can try um let me see what what tools they can use to clear up all the temp stuff on it yeah i'm trying to see what people okay um here let me share screen maybe I'll give you the link. I found something that will might be helpful to you. But I'll drop the in the link in the chat. People make all kinds of website. So it tells you you can clear the cache. Um, And then you have to uninstall some of the, we already did the packages. So, you know, you can try to do auto remove and see if it will clean anything that it's not needed. Um, yeah, I, from what I know with Ubuntu is like, you have to man, for Linux in general, you have to manually. So you can do like auto remove dash purge uh, to see if it's gonna clear up a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then, so those are some of the commands you can use. You can do the get clean. Um, and that's going to be anything that's in the cache so that it's storing, it's going to clear that up. Okay. okay. Yeah. If, if that doesn't work, then I would recommend creating another virtual machine. 
uh, that's probably better than me giving you a virtual machine. You download it because downloading a virtual machine takes a long time. So making another virtual machine, you just need the ISO and then you just, you know, create new and follow the step. But I had walked um, Alex through it and the part where it asks you for the drive size, it usually default to 10 gigs. And when I created that virtual machine, I should have increased it, but you should give it like 20 gigs, which only takes up about like two, uh, I wanna say three or four gigs on your regular hard drive, okay? So you can give it like, I want to say 20 or 30 gigs. That should be plenty. Because on mine, I think I used 25 gigs and I haven't ran into anything um, with that. So you can try those commands and see if it will purge some stuff from your system. Um, there's not a lot of app. I don't think that it has any kind of bloated app on here. Yeah, and ha I had a lot of files on here from all the other labs, as you can see. So, okay. Yeah, that that's true. So yeah, getting, I think the Kubuntu uses a lot of resources anyway. So it's, a, it's you know, while it looks very pretty, um, just making the Ubuntu virtual machine is, you know. And yeah, like I said, it doesn't take very long if you want to make it. Okay. <laughs> Other questions? So Snelly, if you if you have a hard time making the virtual machine, uh, just send me a message later. I can I can always you know put like a clean one on online and you'll be able to download it. But like I said, like downloading from Google Drive will probably be just as long as making it. So, um, but if you need help with that, let me know. Okay. Yeah, I have the original one that um, you created that I downloaded and I made um, one from scratch. Mm -hmm. And the instructions, I think it, yeah, uh, installing the desktop was the problem. Like, yeah, so you don't, 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 you don't have to put the desktop, just make, just use Ubuntu straight. Okay. Right. Yeah, don't, you don't need to put the desktop. We only put the the G, the KDE desktop was because we were using like, you know, for prof call tree, but mm -hmm. that was like one of the first lab. You don't have don't put the desktop. Just okay. after it finishes installed, that's all you're gonna use. Okay, I'll go ahead and create a new one just to avoid. Okay. 